at the end of part... Shut up! We're trying to make a goddamn bus video here! Anywho. <laughs>
you doing there? Just uh, getting used to the closet space. It is. This is where uh, I'm gonna sleep. Right here. Hanging upside down like a bat. After we finished our closet section, we then moved on to the beginning of what would be our shower area. The first step was to construct a wall at the end of our kitchen area, which would serve as one side of our shower. We basically just framed out the wall, just like we did with this back wall here with some two by twos. We then scribed a piece of half inch plywood using the exact same steps that we did for our closet. And we then installed that piece of plywood on the kitchen side of the wall. As we continued on with building structures in the bus, we realized that we wanted to have something opposite the kitchen that also had some counter space and maybe some storage in it. We also realized that we needed to have a place to house our microwave. Traditionally in a lot of RVs and buses and vans, if you have a microwave, it's usually installed kind of in an upper cabinet area. Because of the curvature of these walls, we didn't really have a space to fit even a small microwave, which was kind of surprising. Having curved walls is always full of surprises, let's just say that. So again, we had to get a little creative with how we wanted to store our microwave. Looking at all of the drawers and fridges and freezers that we have on drawer slides, we thought, why not put a microwave on drawer slides as well? In this storage space, we decided to put our microwave where it would sit sideways. We built a platform with undermount drawer slides so that when the microwave would slide out, you still are able to open the door from the side and it slides nicely back in in a way just like our freezer and fridge do. Underneath the microwave, we decided to leave sort of this open cubby area that will house our dog Piper's crate and maybe some odds and ends as well for her. We left this area pretty open so that there would be plenty of airflow so that she would be comfortable when she's in her crate, but also allowed us to stow the crate away and not have it be out in the open. Rounding out all of the structures that we've built in the last few weeks is our kitchen overhead cabinet. This overhead cabinet is the first of three that will be in the bus and seeing it go in really definitely changed the feel of the kitchen area. The construction of this overhead cabinet is relatively simple. It's pieces of three quarter inch plywood for our dividers, one big piece of half inch plywood on the bottom, and then all of that is joined together with some one by threes in the back and some one by twos on the top. The entire structure is drilled into the furring strips that we installed in the very beginning of our bus build. One very important feature that we took into consideration when designing, especially these kitchen overhead cabinets, is the dimensions of them. It's very important when you're building overhead cabinets in the kitchen not to have them too big. You don't want to sacrifice too much storage space, but you also don't want to be hitting your head when you're cooking or washing dishes. And we also didn't want them to be too low. Of the few windows that we did leave in the bus, two of them are situated right in our kitchen, and we didn't want to impede too much of the view of those windows with overhead cabinets. After all of the structures were built, I moved on solely by myself to installing and designing our electrical system. And it really only took a few hours. It was super easy and I did it with none of Jess's help whatsoever. What Greg means by that is that he did not design or install or build any of the electrical system. And I designed, installed and built every electrical component in the bus. Oh yeah, that's right. That's how that went down. Yeah. This is a project that I started, I think right around the time we started working on our kitchen and closet. So four or five, six weeks ago, I think at this point that we just got finished. It's one of the hardest things I've ever done. It was very, very stressful. And at the end of the day though, it works. The, the system is functional and I'm going to walk you through what I did. So the heart of our system is three SOK lithium iron phosphate batteries. These are 206 amp hour batteries. We have three of them for a 618 amp hour battery bank. This is a huge upgrade from our last van where we had AGM batteries. We, it wasn't really enough power for what we were looking to do. and We often ran out. So this time we've gone about as big as we can possibly go. 
there are two sides to our system. There's an AC side and a DC side, obviously 110 current and 12 volt current. On our AC side, we're powered by a 3000 watt GoWise pure sine wave inverter. Uh, pure sine wave is super important for more sensitive electronics and it's something we didn't have in our last build that I'm thrilled that we have now. Um, this inverter powers four different circuits in the bus, three of which are fully functional and installed and include our kitchen outlet, our microwave outlet, and our porch light, which we very recently installed. And that was a really fun experience getting to turn our very first light on in the bus. On the DC side, we have quite a few 12 volt appliances. Again, an upgrade from our previous system, because as you can imagine, the inverter isn't a perfect converter of power. Some power is wasted when the power is converted from 12 volt into 110. The 12 volt side is a little more efficient, so we put as many 12 volt appliances and outlets in here as we could. So we have 12 volt outlets in the bed, our freezer is 12 volt, we'll have 12 volt outlets outside as well, and our lights and our fans are also all 12 volt. Those are the main components of the battery and electric system. We also have a safety fuse right at the very beginning of the battery system. We have a shunt coming off of the negative line that will power our Victron battery monitor after that's installed. We have our solar charge controller, which is ready and waiting for our solar panels to be installed, which has not happened yet. Um, we also have a selector switch, which allows us to switch from shore power to battery power. This was one of the trickier parts of the entire electrical assembly. It involves some really technical stuff to get it working. Um, but we do have a working shore power outlet, just like a regular RV would, that allows us to hook up to house outlets, RV parks, you name it, to pull power from those sources instead. We also have a battery charger on board. So when we're hooked up to shore power, this will allow us to use that external power source to charge our batteries as well. Jess, tell us about this super simple uh, setup we've got here. <laughs> so this is the bones of our electrical system. So the bulk of everything in the bus is powered by our three 206 amp hour lithium iron phosphate batteries from SOK. Uh, I had originally thought about building batteries to save some money, but we decided for simplicity's sake to go the prefabricated route. Um, and SOK is a really great brand for anybody else who's looking for batteries. So from these batteries, we have on our hotline, we have a 300 amp hour safety fuse and we have our battery monitor shunt, which will tell us how much power is in our batteries, how much power we're consuming. Then you come across our little wall here and we have these two heavy duty bus bars that distribute power to the rest of the system. So on one side, we have our pure sine wave inverter. It is a 3000 watt inverter with a 6000 watt peak. Um, and that feeds our breaker panel for our 110 volt outlets. Uh, we have four 110 circuits in the bus. And also feeding into that panel is our shore power switch. So in position two, the batteries will feed um, power into the system in position one, shore power. So an external outlet, campground hookup, house outlet, whatever will power all of our components. And then on the 12 volt side of the system, we have Here's just a battery cutoff switch to cut off power to the 12 volt side of our components. Our solar charge controller that will be ready to take power from our solar panels and deliver that to the batteries when we have those installed. And then back here is our 12 volt fuse block which uh, delivers power to all of the low voltage components in the bus. So there you have it. Seems really simple. So simple. As Jess was working on the electrical system, I got the fun task of crawling around underneath the bus and installing our propane system. The entire propane plumbing system is comprised of 3 8 inch copper refrigeration tubing. We got really lucky with all of our propane appliances in that they all take a 3 8 inch MVT fitting. It makes everything really easy. We don't have to step anything down or use any weird adapters for anything. Everything is all the same size. Our propane system begins, strangely enough, at our propane tanks, which are housed in our propane locker, which you guys saw in part one of this build series. 
Off of our tanks, we have a two-stage regulator that has a built-in automatic switchover valve so that when one tank runs out, it will automatically shift to the next tank. Off of the regulator, we have a pipe that runs through the floor and immediately comes in contact with a ball valve that will serve as a shutoff switch for the entire system. Off of that shutoff valve, we have three lines that run to each of our propane appliances. One line runs to our Propex heater, one line runs to our on-demand hot water heater, and one line runs to our stove and oven. After all of the propane plumbing was in place and all of the fittings were screwed together, the next step was to test the system for any leaks prior to turning on any of our appliances. To do this, I went around with a bottle of soapy water and sprayed each junction uh, to see if it would bubble. And if it did, I went through and just tightened everything, made sure that nothing was bubbling, there were no leaks. And from there, we could go on and test each of our appliances. We got to test our heater on a very nice, hot July day, which was super fun, but it definitely works. But even more gratifying than that, we got to turn on our stove and our oven, which was really, really cool. And uh, now it definitely feels like we're one step closer to having a fully functioning RV. One of the last things that we finished building recently is our air conditioning system setup. So the bus itself has an air conditioner built in, um, but we wanted to add our own solar powered unit so that we could use it when the bus engine wasn't running. So we went with a normal window mounted air conditioning unit. And instead of installing this out of a bus window or anywhere on the exterior that it would be visible, we mounted it in the wall behind us with the back half hanging into the garage space. So the reason these units are usually window mounted is because they kick out a lot of heat. But our bus has kind of a unique feature. On the very back wall of the bus, there are two exhaust fans. Originally, these were used to vent diesel fumes out of the cab of the bus, but because we've put a wall there, they no longer can serve that purpose. What they can do, however, is vent heat out of the garage space and pull it to the outside. So with the unit in that space, those fans work to pull the hot air generated by the unit to the outside. And then there's a vent towards the very top back of the bus that allows cool air in to help create sort of a circular movement of air and keep that space from overheating. The other reason these units are typically mounted outside of a window is because they leak water while they operate. So we had to come up with a system to manage that. So what we came up with was simply a paint tray, which is already graded to one spot. And then we drilled a hole in that paint tray and ran PEX tubing through the wall and then through the floor of the bus so that the water has an easy way to escape and not leak all over our garage space. So that's where we're at in the build right now. We're really in the thick of things at the moment and we're definitely feeling all of the feelings that come with being in the thick of things at the moment. We have a lot planned for the next few weeks and we're looking forward to making even more progress. So if you've been enjoying following along with this process, please do like and subscribe. Thanks so much for watching and we'll see you next time.